So close to the beginning of the first section of Mark's Gospel, Jesus announces that something has cataclysmically changed in the cosmos, okay? Jesus turns up in Mark 1.15 and he says the kingdom of God is at hand and everything that follows, follows from that. Everything that follows in the, in the work, the life, the ministry of Jesus follows from that, the kingdom of God is at hand. Everything that happens in Mark's Gospel follows from that, the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's particularly relevant for the guys in Rome that Peter is telling Mark the stuff he's writing for. Did that make sense in English? Yeah. So Mark is writing, we believe, for the Christians at Rome and for the church at large beyond them, right? But Peter is giving him the stuff to write. And they're talking about the incoming of the kingdom of God and the discipleship that follows from following him as the king bringing in his kingdom. Immediately, he announces the kingdom of God is at hand Jesus spells out the consequence of that, you better repent and believe the gospel because the king is coming and he's not going to be pleased with what's been going on here. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's what starts off Mark's gospel. In scripture, life change is based on world change. The world has changed, the kingdom of God is at hand. Therefore, on the basis of that, repent and believe the gospel. Okay? It's something tangible in that sense. In scripture, life change is based on world change that has taken place. And the consequence of that is then spelled out. If you repent and believe, because the kingdom of God is coming in, then the outcome of that will be that you follow Jesus. He goes straight to those disciples on the beach and he says, "Come." well, they're not disciples yet. But he goes to them and he says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they become disciples. So the kingdom of God is at hand. The consequence of that is repent and believe the gospel. And the consequence of that is that if you've done that, you follow Jesus. And, and the largest part of what Jesus is doing in this world is fishing for men. So followers of Jesus, and he makes this explicit, will be made into fishers of men. Because the kingdom of God's coming and we've got to get these people out of there into this. Before it hits them. So Christians follow a Jesus whose biggest priority in his earthly ministry is fishing for men. Jesus did not come to give me a fulfilled life. That wasn't the priority. That may be the consequence, but it's not the priority. Jesus didn't come to bless me. That may well be a consequence of all of this. It is good to be living his way in his world, right? But that is not the priority. Jesus came so that I would follow him, be saved, be a fisher of men, saving others, because the kingdom of God is at hand and the kingdom of darkness is a powerful, fighting back, but defeated sort of foe. Christians follow a Jesus whose biggest priority in his earthly ministry is fishing for men because the kingdom of God is at hand and such a fact carries consequences for sinners who need to be saved from those consequences. There's the priority and there's why. So at the start of section one of Mark's gospel, Jesus calls people to express their repentance and faith, life change, because of the dawning of the incoming kingdom of God, world change and to express it by their following of Jesus on his mission because they've turned from sin and trusted him. At the start then, chapter 1, 16 to 20, Jesus called his first disciples. And then at the start of section 2 of Mark's Gospel, running from 3, 3 to 6, 6, Jesus chose 12 of those followers to be the leaders of his followers on his mission. And now as section 3 begins, he sends those 12 follower leaders out on their first training mission. Dick Franz put it like this in his commentary. All this time they've been companions and spectators, and sometimes a privileged private audience, rather than partners in his mission. They have not yet been sent out as fishers of men. They've been extras rather than actors in the proclamation of the kingdom of God. They've been standing there. You, you don't train like that. You don't, that, that's maybe the beginning, but certainly not a significant large part of learning to be, a, to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Where the kingdom of God is concerned, the training happens in the deep end of the pool. Now, how do we get that taken on board in contemporary evangelicalism? The training happens when you stick your neck out and you go off and you do what you've just heard about. That's where the training happens and then you come back and we debrief. 
be 100% clear. Disciples of Jesus. Oh, yes, fishers of men. Oh, I haven't done that bit yet. Are trained on the job. Okay. Um, let's do that bit while I, while I remember. <laughs> Here's what happens in this section, the third section of Mark's Gospel. Get the big picture. Jesus sends out the 12. There's the death of John the Baptist and the 12 return to Jesus. That's the first part, section A. Do you see that? You'll see this again, but let's see how much we get now. You know you're going to see this again, don't you? You're looking at me thinking, oh, I'm going to hear this again. He's going to be banging on about this. Yeah, I am, yeah. Okay. So what happens is you've got this section A, then the big section B, then the little section C at the end. And we think Mark is arranging things like this in his gospel so people can remember it. There are patterns. Okay. He's doing this for oral learners. He's not doing this for, for you know, intellectuals like you and me. He's, do he's, doing it, he's doing it for oral learners, okay? So it's clear. He sends out the 12. There's the death of John the Baptist and the 12 return to Jesus. You can remember that. There's a sandwich. Incidentally, watch this. This will come later. He sends out the 12. Guys, we're going off on a mission. And then the meat in the sandwich is the death of John the Baptist for being faithful to God in his mission. And then the 12 return to Jesus. So there's, there's like a sandwich. See the two bits of bread and there's the meat in the middle. See that? You're sent out on mission and your life is on the line. Mm -hmm. And it may be required of you. Not because you've done something wrong, but because you've done something right. It's heavy, isn't it? And then you get this bit in section B. And can you see there's a sort of a, a mirror thing going on? This mirrors this. The feeding of the 5,000 mirrors the feeding of the 4,000. Yeah? Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus supplies all you need in this risky way of living. He's the bread of life. We can do, we'll do more about that. But then you've got Jesus walking on the water, healing in Gennesaret, and God's word and human... Uh, the, the, the three things. Three encounters with Jewish people. Three encounters with Gentile people. And then this middle bit about God's word and human tradition and what makes people unclean. See, relevant to the situation again, isn't it? We'll work all that out. That'll be fine. And then the big climax in the hinge, the hinge in the middle of Mark's gospel is coming. The Pharisees demand a sign. The disciples are confused. The guy needs healing in two stages, and that's really interesting and relevant. And then Peter's confession of Christ. But who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, <coughs> Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed it to you, but my Father in heaven. That's the big hinge in the middle of Mark's Gospel. Okay. Happy bunnies? It'll become more apparent. So, what I was saying was, before I remembered I'd forgotten something, it's my age, okay? That's what it is. It's my age. Um, what I was saying was, disciples of Jesus are trained on the job. That's why our training program that we're getting in place, and thanks Tom for praying about it, identifies people already doing and training them to do better and do more. Can I show you something? This is quite exciting. Can I show you this? See that? See that there? <laughs> Do you know what that is? That, that is a flash drive for a computer, a pen drive, whatever you want to call it. Right? You stick it in the USB and that's it. There is a complete seminary level training course on there. Theological training course. See, that came in the post this week from America. Don't lose it. Don't lose it, yeah. <laughs> don't lose it. It's backed up on a hard drive somewhere, don't worry about it. And we are allowed, I have a letter telling me, in view of what we're doing and trying to do with you know, groups in the countryside and people round and about, and people who are leading groups and saying to me, you know, I'm doing this, I've got no training, Simon, what am I going to do? I was in Welshpool this week with a few people, again, you know, they want, they want this, that'll be starting soon. Um, we can just go into a situation, it, it could even be somebody's living room, it probably won't be, uh, it's not going to be, but, um, you know, and, and guys can learn and do, learn and do, learn and do. And then we, we link people together, so they learn, do, crash, talk to one another. That's the way it works, isn't it? <laughs> you learn, you do, you crash, right? It happens. And then you, you come back together. And you, you see what I mean? And we, we can offer that course free of charge. Free of charge. Can you imagine? If, if folk want to, they can get that, you know, they can get a piece of paper that goes with it from one of the Bible colleges in America if they want to. Uh, astonishing, isn't it? But we learn by doing, and the key thing is that we're building fellowship with people 
so that you know we learn and we do together and then when we crash we get back to one another say what am I going to do about this help me here you learn on the job followers of Jesus or whatever they're doing in being fishers of men because that's an tied up integral part of being a follower of Jesus is to be a fisher of men right however we're doing that we're intended to be actors in the sense that we act not in the sense that we're pretending in the sense that we do stuff and we're trained, yes, by being instructed, but then very definitely by going out and doing what you've seen Jesus do and heard Jesus talk about. In the kingdom of God, training occurs at the deep end of the pool. Now, in this situation, you can see these guys, he is their pattern. They go and they do what he did. In the kingdom of God, he is our pattern. We go and we do what he did. That's scary, isn't it? How scary is that? He did dangerous stuff and they ended up killing him. We told the disciples to do three things on their training mission. They preached that everyone should repent, naturally, because the kingdom of God's coming and the king don't like sin. Secondly, they cast out evil spirits, naturally, because the kingdom of God is opposed by the kingdom of darkness. And although the kingdom of darkness is beaten, it doesn't necessarily act like it all the time. And there will be people who cannot, at this point, they, they are inhibited, they are trapped and they cannot yet turn from sin and trust Jesus the way they need to because the kingdom of God is coming in and extra measures are needed and so that's what they do and thirdly they heal many people again sickness and death are the result of the fall and they thrive where darkness reigns but now the kingdom of God's coming in and all that is preached gets demonstrated that's awkward isn't it <laughs> especially in a church when so many people are ill well Let's forget in this mission there's more than this simply happening here. They're now learning, watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, yes, but now they're learning not just by listening but by doing, and that's a key part of the training of biblical disciples, followers of Jesus. My concern is we haven't had enough of that here, and this hasn't been for our benefit. And there's a lovely deep end, you know, just waiting, isn't there? And we do our bits and so on, but, but look, we need to be looking at that and looking into what goes on. Jesus called the twelve, began to send them out two by two. So this is Mark 6, 7. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, and to put on sandals, but not to wear two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there till you leave the area. The place won't welcome you or listen to. As you go out from there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. You're not messing. Look at the essential components here. Teamwork. Authority over the kingdom of darkness. Incarnation from below, a concept that I shall explain presently. Non-profiteering. And no throwing pearls to pigs. Teamwork. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. Now, there are all sorts of practical reasons you might want to adduce for this. It is wise to work as a team rather than as a lone ranger. It is safer. It means you have someone to pray with and be encouraged by and get feedback from. I'd far prefer to be two families pioneering than one in any given situation I can imagine. Could well be more to it than that. You know, there's a clear old Tafford pattern of clear Old Testament references to things that have to be established by the testimony of two witnesses. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking Deuteronomy 17.6 in particular. There's that Old Testament principle, two messengers going so they could support one another's message. And the point of going in this way is to learn to herald the arrival of the restored kingdom of God and to testify to the fact that it is here. It is at hand. There are facts in it. And those facts need witnesses, and you need two witnesses to establish, the, see, see where this is going? You've got the picture. Certainly in the ancient world it takes two to testify, okay? Didn't have tangos, but testification, testification, testifying, test, testification. <laughs> that sounds like something George Bush would have said. Uh, you know, testifying requires two, doesn't it? Okay? It requires two. But you can do it with two with two. You don't need the full dozen, right? You definitely don't need a mega church. The 
plan is not designed to make it cosy for you. Six sets of two will be fine. Can you imagine that? Now, no doubt Peter seemed better at it than Andrew. But they had to get over their natural dispositions. And, and, and Thomas couldn't say to Peter, oh, I'm going to leave that to you. No, 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 no. You're paired up. And off you all go. Make sense? So why don't we consider the possibility of a church having a neighbourhood outreach wherever two people or two families can start one? You don't need 20 people. On this model, you need two. And it's Jesus' model. He made six teams out of what most churches wouldn't consider starting one house group with. And look what he gave them to work with. <gasps> look, at, look at what they've got, you know, back up. Look, at this. look what he gave them to work with. A budget? <laughs> Not at first. We'll get to the budget. A new campus? A great website? A, a, a terrific PA media launch? Not so. He gave them authority. That's different. Teamwork, authority over the kingdom of darkness. Now you may be tempted to think this is all starting to sound a bit creepy now. It, it isn't creepy, it's just, it's just real world reality, okay? The world has been living in the grip of the Prince of Darkness. Not a popular teaching, but a biblical one. One that accounts for, makes sense of an awful lot of the stuff we see in this world, okay? And which we 20th century evangelicals seem to lament rather than account for. Okay. There's no point in lamenting it. You've got to get stuck into it. Let's not be freaky about it. It's a practical, down-to-earth, nuts and bolts thing. This world lies in the grip of the evil one. He needs pushing back. And we can't. And Jesus can. And he has come bringing the restoration of God's rule, the kingdom of God. And his followers serving him, fulfilling his purpose. So expect to get involved in one way and another in, in conflict with victory over the forces of darkness. He, he alone has, he alone gives his followers the authority they need for the task. But the bearers of light must engage with the darkness in the power that the light of the world gives them. The light, the power, the authority, though... They must learn that it all comes from him. Teamwork, authority, incarnation from below. Have you come across this? This is an important idea. Let's see what you think of it. Uh, it's a term coined by a man called Chris Wright. Chris Wright taught Old Testament in India in Pune for five years at Union Biblical Seminary between 1983 and 1988. It's where he... he just kind of discovered biblically this idea because of his experience in the Indian situation. Then he came back to All Nations Christian College, missionary training college there for a while. He was principal there from 93 to 2001. He's now on staff at All Souls in Langham Place in London, and he's responsible for uh, helping pastors in the majority world and churches and seminaries and stuff like that. In India, he learned that poorer people could much more easily, easily share Christ with rich people than rich people could share Christ with poor people. Did I say that? Was that? You're sitting there as if I haven't said that and I want you to hear it. <laughs> so let me do it again. Did you get it? It's easier for poor people to share Christ meaningfully with rich people than it's for rich people to share Christ meaningfully with poor people. And he makes the case in his book, uh, Introduction to Biblical Ethics, or Old Testament Ethics. Um, he makes the case about that and it's worth looking at. It's worth thinking about. I think there's a lot in that, and the book's well worth a read. It may be a bit of a sideways look at what's happening here, but Jesus is saying, take nothing with you. Go living on me. On this occasion, and it is on this occasion, he says, take no material support with you as you set out on this training mission, because you've got to learn that you can lean on me. Now, later on, he's going to say, if you've got, got a staff, take it. Two shirts, take six. You know, all that stuff. Take what you've got. Take what you can lay your hands on, on a later stage and so on. But at this point, this is a training project, and he's saying, learn this. Budget? We don't have a budget. Do we have a budget? We don't have a budget, do we? I mean, this, this training program, right? You know, great, fantastic. Is there a budget? No, but there's a stick. 
and we work with that. You know, we've got a state. Fantastic. Uh, premises? No. Training program without premises? What's that about? No. Library? No, 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 no. Publicity campaign? I'm supposed to be making a few handbills tomorrow. Do a bit of that. Um, launch? What, what is that? I, I hear a lot about the launch. You, does this happen with you? you? Yeah, okay. The launch, what's that about? Some kind of river boat, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Do they have those in the Bible? I don't know. Now, I'm not saying it's always got to be like that. I'm not saying a budget, an organisation, an infrastructure, props to lean on. I'm not saying it's godless. This is a training mission, after all. We're looking at here, which is, is there to teach them, to demonstrate what can actually be done. It's their first training mission. They are learning that God is the one to be relied upon. But that's actually a lesson worth learning, isn't it? And doing. With nothing but God going for you, the proclamation of Christ's kingdom can go forward. It can go forward. And, and later on, as, as they engage in mission proper, he'll tell them, take stuff with you. Yeah, fine, fine. But the specific instruction for them here has a specific purpose. They're to learn they can lean on their God. And some books by experts on church planting would give you an alternative view. They wouldn't say that. You've got to have this, you've got to have that, you've got to have 200 people to start with, you've got to have this budget, you've got to have that and that and that and premises, and you don't. Because the process is that one disciple, two together preferably, help others to become followers of this Jesus, whose kingdom is at hand, so we must repent and believe the gospel and follow him. That is how you do it. The training is to do the job going light. And that's the first lesson Jesus chooses to teach them. If they have to travel light, if light is what he provide, provides, then light will work fine. And being a little light on the resources that seem needful must be allowed to be no hindrance in doing what you're there to do. They're learning that. We haven't got whatever it is. So let's do that anyway. Leaning on our God. Generating a good revenue stream, building a significant support base out of attracting high net worth individuals to the cause, that is not the idea. Essential elements, teamwork, authority, incarnation from below, poverty, simplicity, not having much so you demonstrate the sufficiency of God. Have you seen a book by... Uh, Ajit Fernando, uh, The Call to Joy and Pain. Some of you have heard me talk about it before. Ajit Fernando. Ajit Fernando runs campus, no he doesn't, he runs no campus, he runs Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka, right? So you know what's happened in Sri Lanka with all the intercommunal violence and the civil war type stuff been going on over the years. The man has seen a lot of pain and suffering. And he's got a real clear view of, on a theology of what it is to follow Jesus and to be empowered in your ministry out of that uh, poverty and suffering and that book helped me a lot to understand that poverty and pain are important components in commending the gospel to the lost if you want to commend the gospel to the lost you don't come with a slick car and with a big powerful campaign with multimedia whatever whatever he's saying it is what a man will go through for the cause of the kingdom of god that empowers his gospel and gives it credibility and of course, we've got that example of Paul, haven't we? When he's you know, facing opposition in, in the congregations in Corinth and everybody's kicking off and you know, Paul's got a stutter or something or we don't know what it is. He's not a great speaker and he's sort of peering a bit because he met Jesus on the Damascus Road and it messed up his eyesight. Remember that? Um, so, a bit like this. Um, so, you know, they're thinking, he's not, he's, not much of a, well, he's not much of a preacher, is he? We've got much better preachers here than him. You know, what's he saying? And it's discrediting his gospel, which is, after all, the truth. And how does he give credibility to his ministry? He says, shipwrecks, beatings, hunger, cold, you know, stoned <laughs> in the bad way. Well, they're all bad ways. But, um, you know, he doesn't say, I trained at the feet of Gamaliel the Great, you know. He doesn't say, hey, I had a vision of the seventh heaven, you know. He points to the sufferings, the hardships, the poverty he had endured for the sake of God's elect. If I must boast, I'll boast about the things that show my weakness. 
to the, the all-sufficient Saviour might be more clearly seen. So Christ's followers that have no whiff about them of going where the going was best. When you enter a house, stay there. Don't go next door because you get better dinners. Because all the travelling philosophers and teachers and rabbis of the day would, would get hospitality here and then they'd, they'd find a nicer house would take them in so they'd go there. They're going where the pickings are richest. And you're not to be like that, says Jesus. They'd have no taint upon them of taking the top dollar and honouring the well-heeled, the largest donors, the richest hospitality. Go where you're invited. Stay there till you leave. Honour the first movers in the kingdom of God. And don't go where the feather bed beckons you on. But, and here's the balance to that, know when to blow people out. Not on the basis of their hospitality, but on the basis of their response to the preaching of the kingdom of God. No pearls for pigs. Did you see the poster for this week's service? <laughs> Do I bother? I still bother. I still keep bothering. I still keep doing these. There you go. You're going to see it now. There it is. There's the poster. Do you like my poster? Yes, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I know people in this town who have that as a, a real live issue for them. When should I give up on this person? Not Christian people. But maybe there's somebody they know who's got needs and it's complicated and, and they're trying to help. You know, they want to give up sometimes because people can be hard work. I, I had a hippie lady in my car earlier this week and you know son is really hard work he's, he's not quite right and who knows what was getting smoked or shot or whatever when he was young and baby before he was born even who knows what I don't know I don't know anything about that except that he has needs and there's only a limit there's a real limit to what she can do it would be for any of us when do you give up on somebody Grace Van Dilo welcomes you to when should you give up on someone that was today there's some you simply can't help Jesus says, verse 11, if a place will not welcome you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So here are two criteria for continuing or not continuing to hold out Jesus to a people. Do they want you there? Do they listen to you about Jesus? That's challenging, isn't it? Because I look at Tlandailo some days and I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's two visitors, nine, ten, eleven count Caleb. Uh, eleven, so minus two, nine, there are nine of us. And how long have we been here? Ten years. Now hang on, stop, because there are people who've come through and benefited and gone, right? And there are people all over the place today uh, doing stuff for the Lord. That's not the question. The question is, do they listen? I'm pretty clear people want us here. I hear and see enough to know that people want us here, which is great, isn't it? Isn't that nice? Nice to be wanted always, isn't it? Are they listening? There's the next challenge. Some seem to be. So on days when it's difficult, on days when you think, why are we bothering doing this anymore? You say, hang on, here are the two criteria. Are they fulfilled here? See, the followers of Jesus are not social workers, okay? Social work, at its best, helps people we should help people but it doesn't save people and the point that is getting made here is that getting help is not an appropriate response to the world changing event that the kingdom of god is at hand the kingdom of god is at hand it's not help you need it's saving you need <laughs> does that make sense have i said that in english yeah now we want we want to help people but, but the kingdom of God is at hand. And repentance and faith and following life change are the proper response to the fact that the kingdom of God is at hand. The world has changed. They want us there? Well, not always they don't, of course, but, but it's great when they do. That means you can't do anything, anything for them because the message is tied up in its messengers. If they won't have the messenger, they won't have the message. You see, they need to want you there. If they won't have you, that precludes their hearing from you. But then there's a step beyond that. Will they hear you? The message of Jesus is a message. And if you won't hear that message, he's got nothing for you. 
Message announced, message received, message understood. Message of world change brings message of the need to embrace life change. And if you honor the message of life change, then the world change that is happening is going to simply collide with your prospects. You haven't been helped. And there comes a point for the, for the fishers of men, for the followers of Jesus, when there are people over there who haven't heard it yet, while you over here have heard it several times over. And something needs to change, one way or another. What are the messengers to do in that circumstance? Shake the dust off your feet as you leave as a testimony against them. Ooh. Now that's serious. That's going to court as a hostile witness against them. Their refusal to turn and trust. That's serious stuff. And shaking the dust off your feet, well, the rabbis shook the dust off their feet when they left Gentile territory. They were repudiating the Gentiles' defilement as they left. You stay in your defilement, I don't want any part of it, it stays with you. That community has been marked in that way for judgment a stark, a very poignant reminder of the very serious consequences of rejecting those who carry the authority of God, reinforcing their message and their mission. So, there, if you like, are the features of that mission. Teamwork, authority, a humble position in society, if you like, incarnation from below, non-profiteering, not going where the pickings are richest, not throwing pearls to pigs. What are the outcomes? Very quickly, I'm going to skip through the slides, okay? They went out and they preached that all should repent. Jesus said, do it. They went and did it. Here's what they preached. Time to repent. Got to get off that road. Got to get on this road. Turn around. There's the message. In fact, that's a reference back to Mark chapter 1, 15 and, and the, the whole thing that's spelled out there. The message is spelled out more adequately there and then the, 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 there's the, the key word of repent is used throughout the gospel then to refer back to the whole package, but you get the idea. And they did. They cast out many demons. And they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, what's going on here? Um, dicey stuff we're all a bit shirty about. Uh, well, we need to just say, have you seen that thing about oil? See that about oil there? You ever done that? I remember being a young minister in a church in Gravesend, and it was going well, and people were getting converted. We had a leadership team in no time. And fantastic. Things were flying. And uh, a baby in the church. A young couple in the church were having a baby and they had this baby and they were told this baby was going to die. Really sad. And the baby was born, the baby was put to one side. Do you know what I mean? And a few days, we were praying. <laughs> we were praying as young believers do. Do you know what I mean? Scarily. And um, the baby lived. And they sent for me. So after church that Sunday, I said to these new guys in leadership, it wasn't even elders or deacons or anything, we didn't know what we had, so we were just, we were just the leadership team, okay? Everybody was in. And um, we just, I said, guys, we're going to the hospital to pray. With the confidence of a young man, do you know what I mean? The confidence of, you know, when you're, before you're 25, you think you're immortal, don't you? Yeah. That sort of confidence, and it was, guys, we're going to go and pray. And they looked at one another and they said, okay. It was like they were, going to, they were going to salute smartly and charge up the hill behind me, but they didn't quite know what territory we were getting into. We're going to go and pray. So I went home and I found this bottle of olive oil in the cupboard somewhere. It must have been there for ages. I don't know how long we'd had it. I found this other thing and we went up the hospital. Do you remember this? It's donkeys years ago. And we prayed for this little baby. And we put oil on the little baby. And the little baby lived. And I just did this and prayed and said, Amen. And I could just see the guys going, has he finished? <laughs> you know, is that it? And one of them turned to me and he actually said, is that it? <laughs> is that it? Think so, that's it. Do you know any more to do? <laughs> that's what we got, we'll do that. Do you know the baby lived and we saw the baby not that many years ago and was still living. She was disabled and she was a joy to them. She lived. What is this business with oil? I think, I think my guys were a bit nervous when they saw me pull this bottle out of my pocket. What's he going to do now, you know? Uh, but uh, firebomb or something, yeah, no, not that. Uh, it was just olive oil. Now, there's nothing magic about it. But it's in the scriptures. Why? Think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. This will help. 
Now, of course, in the Old Testament, you know, the high priest was anointed with oil. It was a sign of the Spirit coming on him or something of that sort. Uh, and kings were anointed with oil. They were the Lord's anointed, and that was a sign of the Spirit coming on them for their task. It was a, a sign that the symbol was coming on them, uh, the Spirit was coming on them to uh, fulfill a particular role in God's plan. But, but that's not what's going on with the Good Samaritan. What's happening there? He's ill. He's beaten up badly. And along comes the Good Samaritan, and he pours on oil and wine. And in first century Palestine, you didn't have very much by way of medicine. But they would use oil as a medicine. And of course, you know, they anointed many sick people with oil and they prayed for them. But there's this double thing going on. There's a suggestion that they're using medicine and prayer. Something to think about, isn't it? Repentance was preached. They went out and preached that all should repent. Deliverance was secured. They cast out many demons. Nothing else is said. How many words? I can know in the original how many words we got. You've got five in the English translation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, did that. Yeah, fine. Healing was procured and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That's all you're told. Is it? Yeah, did it. Says it in the book. Went and did it. Bosh, job done. Oh. How about that? So, quick, quick succession. Bang, 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 bang. There it is. Conclusion. Here's the question. Who wants us to be a Bible church? Because a biblical church is not characterised by being an institution with a particular pattern of corporate structure. It's not a set of commonly applauded, necessarily respectable, agreed practices and procedures for Sunday worship. I've grown increasingly worried about the church planting movement. My, my last 32 years have been a part of that. Our life has been a part of that for the last 32 years. And I'm concerned where that movement's going for this reason. Planting churches has become a process in itself and the aim and the goal of the mission of God in making disciples is being lost in it. We're here to plant churches. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not it. Uh, Bill Chapman shared on Facebook this week a tweet from Mike Breen. If you make disciples, you'll always get the church. But if you try to build a church, you'll rarely get disciples. Should I say that again? Because that's clever, isn't it? Yeah, it wasn't me. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed. If you make disciples, you'll always get the church. Jesus said, go make disciples, you'll get the church. But if you try to build a church you will rarely get disciples. What it takes is one disciple and another disciple making another disciple. That's what it takes. We so badly need to get that sort of biblical thinking onto our mental front burner. And when Jesus finally left Palestine for glory, his great commission to his followers went like this. And spot the echoes was this first time he sent them out. Matthew 28, 18. All authority, we've heard that today, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah, we've heard that today. Baptizing them. We'll come back to that in a minute, perhaps. There's the repentance reference, the baptism thing. Teaching them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That, that sort of gels with what we've been looking at. And remember, I'm with you always, to the end of the age, till this kingdom that we've proclaimed as coming in is fully consummated at the last. One last thing. It can be terribly costly. See, baptism is a symbol, isn't it, of dying to an old way of life and starting to live a new one. So there's a lot that's just going to get buried. We, we need to build a baptistry. Does anybody feel up for a bit of woodwork? I think we, we haven't had one for 10 years, and I feel really rotten about it, uh, in that a whole tranche of our young people have grown up and gone away and been baptised somewhere else later because we haven't provided. It's not right. We haven't got a tank. Where will we keep it? You know, stuff like that. The whole symbolism of coming into this gospel, this faith, this following of Jesus is costly symbolism but for John the Baptist 
And there he is in the sandwich between the sending out and the coming back of the disciples. It's not symbolically costly. Remember years and years ago, do you remember Sue? Sue was converted on a, a landing in Oxford during the Nigel Lee mission years ago. And within two, three years, Sue was in Latin America serving the Lord. And she had a cholera outbreak on one side of her and the Shining Path gorillas on the other. Brings it home to you, doesn't it? Maybe we, or maybe people we encourage to become disciples of Christ with us, will end up being beheaded in Iraq. Or something. It can be terribly costly. Faithful discipleship comes at a cost. But the essential components in this mission are teamwork, authority over the kingdom of darkness, incarnation from below, non-profiteering, no pearls for pigs, and the outcomes of that training mission are repentance preached, deliverance secured, healing procured, glory to God, and the salvation of the lost. So that's the character of the training for the mission Jesus sends his people, all his people, off on to express their following of him because they've repented and believed on account of the fact that the kingdom of God is coming in. And that is how you train people to do it. In the deep end. And that is what you will be doing if you're going to be a follower of Jesus. You're making disciples. That's what you're for. So here comes the big fundamental question. How does that compare with what we're currently doing? And how do we get convergence in that area? <laughs>